Thank you for coming to the book launch. Um, Walking in Isolation has been a project that's kind of been sitting with us for two and a bit years now. It feels like it's been a, um, an accomplice through some pretty interesting times, interesting times for everyone, I'm sure. Um, it's really nice for me to have the launch of Walking in Isolation here in F-Stop um, because the book and the journey and the kind of um, I was walking up on the hill, but I was thinking about a lot of other things. Um, and F-stop is one of the things that kind of was evolving and developing in my mind while I was walking those hills and trails. So uh, it felt very appropriate. Um, before I introduce Lachlan um, for a poetry reading this morning, I do want to just say thank you to a few people. Um, even though working on a book is, um, well, it's been a collaborative effort. Um, for Lachlan and I, but the project wouldn't have become what it is today without the help of a lot of other people along the way. Um, so I just really want to say a quick thank you to all of the F-Stop Workshop members. Um, some of them are here, some of them aren't, but they've seen different versions of this book over the last two years um, and have offered really generous feedback um, and have helped it become what it became. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to a couple of friends who particularly reviewed the work with me and gave me um, really useful feedback. Um, Patrick, of course, and my friend Jacob um, and Drew Halliday all gave really generous time and sat with the work for several weeks and um, were pretty honest with what they thought and it helped the book become a better thing. Um, I can't do anything without thanking my wonderful partner, Kate. Uh, she's probably seen the book as much as me, um, maybe a little bit less than me, but certainly more than anyone else. Um, she saw every iteration and always um, helps with putting things together. Um, and then I want to thank Lachlan because I have never worked with a poet um, in this way and I've never had someone make me reimagine my work in such a powerful way. It was really, it wasn't something I was expecting and from the first email exchange, um, actually, I'll tell you how the story happened because it makes more sense. Um, so uh, I live at the foot of Willans Hill and Lachlan lives over in Turvey Park as well. Uh, we were all working from home like most people um, during, must have been winter 2019 when it started. Um, and I would see Lachlan running past my house each morning while I was sitting up on the balcony um, drinking my coffee. Um, I thought he was much more industrious than I was. I didn't walk until much later in the day. Um, but I realised that in that routine of being in lockdown, I was seeing Lachlan really regularly and I was doing the same thing every day. I was walking up over the fire trails and the Wiradjuri walking track on Willans Hill, um, just making photos and listening to music, which is what I do. Um, and I sent Lachlan an email with eight photographs and said that these are what I've been making and we had spoken some time ago about working together on a project um, and we thought now is as good a time as any to start. Lachlan um, had the photos with him for not very long in my mind and sent back the first walking in isolation Sestina, um, basically unchanged from how it's published today. And it just blew me away and I got really excited and it changed the way I was walking, it changed the way I was looking. Um, and it gave me a whole new interest in that practice that I've been doing for years um, and led to something that, I mean, I'm, I would like to say I'm still doing it. I haven't walked up the hill with my camera for a couple of weeks now, but for a good two years I was doing it every day and really um, this project, I think, I hope communicates that kind of reflection and repetition and engagement. Um, so yeah, I really want to thank you for that, Lachlan, because it's been a really special process. Um, and now I'd like to invite you to um, come and read everyone one of our poems, one of your poems. Thanks, Lachlan. Yeah, I also, also want to thank everyone for coming. It's really lovely of you to come and support us in what we're doing. I remember, um, uh, I think it was 2013, I first met James and Hamish, who's here, was very, very small. And James, we went to an exhibition uh, that James was putting on at the Wagga Gallery called Void. Um, and I've got some beautiful images of little Hamish um, in front of these huge 
photos. Um, and it's been a real honor to work with James on this project. Uh, when he first um, sent me an email and sent through some images, um, I was, yeah, I was <laughs> deeply affected by them and the way that he sees the world around us. Um, there was a certain edge to them and there was a certain darkness, but there was also a kind of sense of hope. Um, and I just think um, the way he looks at Wattle, for example, those bl black and white images of Wattle, the way he will offer up a tarpaulin. I've never seen a tarpaulin uh, photographed in with that kind of uh, resonance. Um, and so what I tried to do was to uh, barely caption his photos with single words, six of them. Um, and then I thought... Um, uh, the Sestina form. So the Sestina form has, in poetry, is a bit complex. It's a French form, um, but it it uh, has these stanzas, six of them, that rearrange the six words at the end of each line in an algorithmic sense, and then it's got a kind of envoy at the end in which those six words get kind of concentrated into three lines. And I thought, gee, this form is so helpful when we're thinking about what it means to be isolated and walking the same tracks again and again, seeing the same things again and again, but perhaps a little differently each time, uh, such that um, the swing set might be slightly shifted, the light will be different, um, the drain where uh, someone might emerge from and kill me uh, <laughs> might look different this time to last time. Uh, and I was also thinking about... Um, uh, the textures of the way we live during lockdown when all the meetings seem quite artificial and on Zoom. Um, and and so I wanted to sort of bring that in as well. So I wanted to kind of... Uh, and, and the incredible thing is that James then went out and reshot a lot of these photos after my poems. And I think um, that's just incredible to me that a poem can... Uh, could have could have um, maybe got James to see the world in a, a new, in a different way, um, and so uh, I, I think the poems, um, the photos that he's done, they just they're still very arresting to me. Um, um, so I just wanted to read one of the poems, maybe uh, "Walking in Isolation," Sestina One. You've got to adjust to sound library bird song and looped wattle every day or two. The root around that mute stump that still grips the earth. The hidden tessellations of brick arranged like plenitude dominoes ten to ten. A hard path fades into itself, lineating these troubled and overgrown times. Virulent as an introduced species. Your unmoving wheel is set back like a game show moment ready to occur. The wheel promises so much, or at least echoes a playlist shaking the wattle in programmatic versions of Australiana. A good world, overgrown with distant cruise ships and connecting flights and a dumb stump speech instantly appearing in non-relevant places promising a pathway out of this mess. Someone responds by throwing a brick. It's, it's only a passionate act if stuff breaks. Otherwise, a thrown brick just falls onto grass, waiting with indifference to catch the wheel of an earnest mountain biker straying from such a narrow path. You place darkness on the edges of the frame, causing the wattle to become an algal bloom in the water supply. Flare-ups a stump flash, cornerstoned light, and white flower realities, where overgrown moments chorus an elegant terror. This isn't over. Grown large, fear still spreads in standard rhizomes, memes of brick and surfaces that resist sanitization. The chainsaw cut stump offers itself as platform and table. Legitimate picnic with great wheel of regional cheese, eaten here in a socially distant way. Wattle seed flavoured like flecks of doubt. Calculate the sprayed path with respiratory distances, with mask or without mask, as pathogens diffuse through dreams like conspiracy theories, 
overgrown engagement metrics supercharge the entire system. A sprig of wattle in my hand. That's from the Australian cricket team song. Uh, Droplets of spit and beer leap from the players' mouths. Brick batting victorious phrases across the nation of sponsors. Wheel grabbed in such a way, you also become a winner, mate. Stumped him off the last ball. Pitch like a path, path like a pitch. Sands stumps because the spectacle has now finished. But you're still walking a path for some reason. Leaf strewn and disappearing. Clancy, you must wheel them. That's from Clancy of the Oval. No, Man from Snow River, sorry. Uh, See that curve ahead? Don't you know the ending yet? Overgrown amalgam of native and introduced. Explorer's hut, adumbrated by bricks laid in order. Cut tree, noticed hubcap, track in low power mode, black and white wattle. This wheel song turns and promises to carry you into overgrown locations, e.g. the stump where you dropped a pin, so that the true path might emerge next time with its brick Ebenezer and shivering wattle. Thanks. I won't read the other two because they're quite long, but um, the second one kind of... Uh, if you go away and read it, takes up this idea of Orpheus and Eurydice. I mean, we begin the book with an epigraph from Dante about uh, finding ourselves in a darkling wood where the path is not clear. Um, And I think that's our experience of walking and running Willens Hill is that there are different paths uh, being created and not created. But uh, this myth of Orpheus and Eurydice um, uh, sort of came to my mind when I saw one of James's images, which was a drain. And it's the kind of drain that you know, a killer might come out of that it might come and get you. But um, those portals to the underworld, I think, are really interesting to me as these spaces um, in which we might see something new and different um, and so, uh, and that we might become paranoid about. The myth of Orpheus and Eurydice is that um, he goes to find Eurydice. He's got this beautiful song that occurs after his wife is taken into the underworld um, and he has to lead her out without turning around uh, to see whether she is following. Um, and so part of me thinks perhaps he turned around because he wanted to keep his song uh, and not his wife. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the second poem. And the third one um, is um, uh, speaking a little bit about art um, and democracy and politics um, and what what these images kind of show us or bring to us, in what ways are they evidentiary or non-evidentiary? How do they speak to us about what is given and what is true and what is real, particularly in a world where everything seems to be always and already claimed by other things? Um, so it's a, it's a kind of meditation on what might What's the evidence? And and in that, I was thinking about this tarp, the forensic nature of a tarp on the ground and how that can be kind of evidentiary in a certain sense. So for me, that's the kinds of things I was thinking about. I, I wanted to give a huge thank you to James because his um, work on this has just been outstanding and just relentless and um, thoughtful. And he is a powerhouse of photography here in Wagga. We are very, very lucky to have someone of his expertise and caliber and um, his, his kind of attention to detail. Uh, I, I kind of run around and take photos with my iPhone, but James really has, uh, is, is a, a one of Australia's, I think, great up and coming photographers. So keep an eye out for the next works. And thanks so much for everyone for coming. It's been really wonderful. Thanks. <laughs>